talking about removing the roof. And those of you who don't know Gabe, he's in the roofing business. So I thought this would be apropos for him to be here today to, to kind of talk about this. But a lot of us, I don't know if you know this story very well. We haven't talked, I haven't spoken on this that I can remember of in a long time. I can't even remember the last time I used this particular set of scriptures. But I think it's, I think it's worth it for us to kind of take a look at it from a different point of view today. So we're going to be reading from the book of Mark. And so we can read here together if you'd join me up here on the screen. It says, a few days later, when Jesus again entered into Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing him, a paralytic man, carried by four of them. Since they could not get to him, to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowering the mat the man was laying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts, and he said to them, Why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to this paralytic man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. He got up, took his mat and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone and they God saying, what? We have never seen anything like this. You know, a couple of weeks ago, I gave a message. We've never, that Jesus made, thing, made things happen and said things that happened that people were always amazed. And this is another one of those things. So they just couldn't, they couldn't quite get over that he was saying these kinds of things and people were having these kinds of miracles happen to them. But I want you to think about it this morning, that this here is an example. It's like a template for what I want you to think about your own life or maybe someone else's life. Because I want us to go back and take a look at this right here. It says, this amazed everyone and they praised God saying, we have never seen anything like this. Jesus was in the house. And I want you to think about this for a moment. If Jesus is inside your house, there are gonna be things going on. And I want you to think about it. You know, if Jesus were to show up right now at AA Center, if he were to show up, no one would know he would be there. There would be a handful of people that might be in tune with the Spirit of God that would know by revelation that he was there. But other than that, no one would know about it until someone said something about it. And that's what happened here. Jesus came home. We actually think he's actually in Peter's home because Peter lived in Capernaum. And as he's here, he shows up. No one knows about it, but suddenly things begin to happen in that house that the word begins to get out that Jesus is there. And it says a few days later when Jesus began to enter Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. Well, that word got out. I'll tell you something. If Jesus is living on the inside of you, there are going to be things going on that people are going to see and they're going to begin to talk about. They're going to talk about them. Because you're going to begin to have a life that's not all messed up. I think about our community. I think about how many people's lives that I know that are really messed up. Some people don't have a job. Some people have been thrown out of their family that they have no family to call home. They have given themselves to all kinds of, you know, emptiness tools, alcohol, sex, drugs, all these things trying to fill up on the inside, which if Jesus were living there, they wouldn't have that problem. They wouldn't have those needs. And I want you to think about it for a moment. We all know that he fills us up, that there are no empty spaces on the inside left for him. But see, not everybody knows that. And I guess my question is, if we all know that, we should be talking about what Jesus does for us. We should really be explaining to them the reason why, first off, uh, that we drive the kind of cars we drive or that we live where we live or we have the jobs that we have or we have the friends that we have or we have the family that we have. All of the reasons why I have all of those is because of one person. When I came out, I didn't think that I was going to have very much left. 
And God reminded me that I had him and that was all I needed. There's an old, old song, he is all I need. He is all I need. Jesus is all I need. That song kept playing over and over and over in my head. If I just remembered that, I knew that every need that I would have would be supplied. Didn't feel like I had much of a family left. My kids still loved me, my wife hated me. All of those things happened and I didn't feel like I had much. And he kept reminding me, if we keep reminding people that he is all they need, they're not gonna be seeking out things that will supply them just for a moment. That, that, that drug just lasts for so long. Then they need to take more of it the next time to feel the same kind of, the same kind of feeling, the same kind of warmth or whatever it is that they get when they do that, that they just need to know that Jesus is there. And somehow that's what begins to happen here. You know, he goes out and people heard that he was in the house. They began to talk about, it. wow, you know, I was, at, I was at Peter's house the other day and Jesus was, what do, we, well, what, what do you mean Jesus was there? He began to do things. He, began to, he just began to say things, things that changed my life, things that I've never heard before, that I had hope, that I could be well, that the things that were wrong in my life that he had answers for, all I needed to do was listen. People just need to listen. If they will take and read what's in the Bible, if they'll just read the words, if they just get a red letter edition of the Bible, if they'll just read those, I guarantee you that the problems in their life will go away because he has the answer to everything. Now, here's the thing. The people heard that he had come home so that many came to the house and it couldn't contain them. So there's this big, you know, people begin to come and there's a swelling of people around the house. Everybody's in the house, everybody's around the house, and people heard that Jesus was there doing miracles. So what happened is, there's this paralytic man. And we don't know what caused it, we don't know that history, but we do know he had four friends. And I want you to think about it just for a moment. Who do you know right now that has a lot of, a lot of stuff going on in their life? I mean, it's, it's not good stuff, not good stuff. I know people who are worried about their jobs, who are worried about their health, who are worried about whether or not they're gonna have food in the house, whether or not they're gonna be able to pay the rent, all of these things. I know people like that. I know people like that. And it's not you. I know people outside of church that are in those circumstances. And the thing I keep reminding them, how's your relationship to God? How's your relationship to God? What, you know, they have no peace in their life. I sit down and I listen to people and I, and I, 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 I sit there and I wonder what, what would it take to make a difference in that one single person's life? What can I do to help them see that Jesus really is the answer? You know, these four guys knew that Jesus was the answer. They didn't know why, maybe what would happen to him if they didn't, but they had this, they had this thing going on in their head. They know that Jesus is in, in that house and they said, you know what? We've got to get him in there. Now they couldn't do that. It says some men came bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, can't press through, there's no reason I can get him there. They decided, you know what? They're gonna take the roof off of this house. Now if you can imagine, <laughs> you know, can you imagine you're in your house, you're entertaining and suddenly somebody starts to, to, starts to break through the roof of your house? You got this big crowd, all this is going on. You might think about it in your new house. You know, here they are, they're working on their house and suddenly there's this big cave coming in. I can just imagine Jesus is there and he's kind of trying to step back because all this stuff is coming down from the ceiling. And it goes on, it says, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowering the mat the man was laying on. So here these four guys are, they're lowering him through the roof how big of an opening would that have to be? You know, we're not talking about small. This guy's on a mat. They're laying him down by four corners and they're laying him down. I want you to think about that sight just for a moment. What would that have been like? We're gonna come back to this scripture in just a moment. But I want you to notice the situation here. There are so many people in this place because they heard that miracles were happening right here. Things were going on 
that were changing people's lives and that word spread and more and more people came less and less likely would it be that they would be able to get this guy through so they said there is only one way to do this they looked up at that roof and they said we're going to get him up there and we're going to chop a hole in that roof I don't know how many friends I have that would be that willing to chop a hole in my roof to get to me but you know what these people did these people cared enough for this person that they were willing to go to such great extents. Now, I can't imagine what was going through their head. We're going to talk about that just for a moment. But they just know that they need to get him to Jesus. That's the only thing they know. They know that he can't be helped by any other means. He's helpless. He's a beggar. He's on the sides of the street. They've seen him all the time, but they know now that the only 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 hope for this man is to rip that roof off to get him to Jesus. I just can't imagine the desperation of those four because I'm sure things are going through their head. How many of you would go to the same kind of extent for a friend? You think? I, I would like to think about that. I would like to think about that. What would they do? You see, in times of desperation, people will do anything. I know we remember these. Hasn't been that long ago. Some of you are really young. But I, was, I remember I was teaching down here at College Station. I was teaching at Texas A&M. And I'd stepped out of, out of the room, given the class a something to do, a little project to do. And I stepped out. And there in the lobby, I could see the big screens and this was up on the big screen. I couldn't believe it. The first one had just hit. And I stepped back in and I stepped back out and I saw the second plane come and hit the second tower. Now you know, I will tell you something. Churches that following Sunday were packed. Packed. That following couple of weeks, those of us that were around, we, ha we hosted Tammy Faye Baker before she passed away at Pride in September of that year. Tammy Faye had come in. She didn't want to come. We'd already booked her, already done everything. She didn't want to get on a plane. I don't blame her. Didn't blame her at the time. I mean, there weren't very many planes back up in the air yet. Uh, I was stuck there. I had to rent a car, drove back, had to speak in Waco at Baylor and on my way back on that, on that week. But it was, it, was a, it was a sad time. People, I mean, I got out of Waco before the pilots did because they were still trying to get planes in the air. People at desperate moments in their life will do desperate things. And I want you to think just about it this morning. Is there something going on in your particular life that is so desperate that you don't have an answer for it? then you might want to rip off your own roof to get to an answer. See, these four people were doing everything they could do in the ordinary way. They were trying to get him in. They were trying to push through. They were trying to do everything that they knew how to do. But they just keep coming up with the same old answer. There's not a way to get to him. And I think about that in my own life sometimes. When, when I think that I, I have got a barrier in my way, what can I do to get around it, go under it, go over it. Sometimes it just doesn't look like there's any way. And then you need to do something that is as unusual as busting through a roof to get to be a change. And it's difficult to think about it. But you know what? Part of their minds, these four guys, as they were thinking about all this, they were thinking about, this is absolutely crazy. I'm sure it's going through their head. What are we going to do? This is an expensive roof. We're going to have to pay for this roof. I'm sure that all of those things were going through my mind. This is not going to work. You know, he's going to get disrupted. They're going to usher him out of the room because all this stuff is coming down. They're going to take Jesus out of the way, and we're going to have gotten there, and absolutely nothing will have happened. Every one of these things, I'm sure they thought about. How crazy is this? What are we doing? What were we thinking as they're chunking great big holes out of this man's roof? What are we doing? What are we doing? They were doing the only thing that they had left to do. And sometimes people are not willing to do the only thing left because they're afraid. They're afraid of the consequences. 
What's going to happen if it doesn't work? But you know what? They took the roof off anyway. They said, I don't care what it costs. I'm going to do this. Well, you know, expense comes in a lot of different ways. Expense doesn't just come in money. Expense comes in, well, am I ever going to be invited to this person's house again? Probably not. <laughs> Probably never get to go. But you know what? There are other things that are expenses. Personal thoughts about yourself. Well, I'm, I'm really embarrassing myself by doing all this. What are they thinking about me? Well, you know what? <coughs> if I'm the guy on the mat, I'm thinking, yeah, 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 if I'm guys down here, that's all this junk, so I'm going to, no, no, no. But they kept on. They kept on doing that. <coughs> so I want you to think about it just for a moment. <coughs> the roof is really a metaphor about taking off your own personal limits. See, these guys were thinking about it for this man, but I want you to think about it for you this morning. See, they've got all these obstacles that they've got, <coughs> and I want you to think about it this morning. You know, it's crazy. It's absolutely crazy to do and to believe for something that is unattainable. You know, a couple of weeks ago, after being off for quite a while, I had to kind of pick up and go back to work. I know, I know none of us liked that thought, but I was off from December to March and then kind of had to pick up and start pretty fastly building back up an income. And I went and I did a couple of trips. And I decided that I was going to put God to the test. Because every once in a while, even pastors need to do that. That's a good thing. Because I told myself, I don't want to have to work as hard. So God, I want you to show me a way where I can work smarter. Smarter. And I was on the phone with my manager, my management team up in Kansas City. And I was talking to my manager and I said, if you'll look at my numbers, I said, I changed something a couple of weeks ago. And I said, it looks like it's working. Two weeks later, all the evidence came in that it was working. Because they decided to do something I've been kind of afraid to try. I've been a little afraid because I'm in a business where I'm teaching a lot of people and I get paid to teach, but I also get paid to sell resources that go along with that. And I've always kind of just like shown them and let them sell themselves, but I decided, you know what? Either I believe in the materials enough to tell them that you need to buy them or not. It's like you telling people, do you want a five-year roof or do you want a 40-year roof? Five-year roof will be fine. It'll suit you for five years, but the 40-year roof, you're gonna pay for the labor one time. It's the product that you're gonna buy different. And that's kind of the philosophy that I used with them. And I told them, I said, you know what? Some of you are gonna get some of this and it's gonna help you, but you need to get a lot because it'll help you a lot. I didn't feel any different until I saw the orders come in. I haven't really changed anything other than said, you really need this. And I'm telling some of you today, some of you really need to rip the roof off of your own limits. The things that you've set in front of yourself that say, I cannot do this anymore. I can't do it. I can't reach that plateau. I can't do it because there are too many things in the way. There's too many people in the way for me getting to the goal that I want. Too many challenges. The cost is going to be too high. I'm, I'm either going to lose friends, lose business, or both. It is a metaphor. So I want us to take a look at this just for a moment. You know, in the business world, these things kind of come into play. Uh, you've heard about reaching your ceiling. You've reached it. You've gone as high as you can possibly go. This is as far as you're ever going to get. How many, don't raise your hands. How many have ever heard that? You're at it. This is the ceiling. So I decided I'm not going to take somebody else telling me I'm going to have to take less. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to take more. Thank you, baby girl. I'm going to take more instead of less. I want to work less, but I want to make as much, if not more, than I'm making because I don't want to work. I, you know, Jeff and I were talking the other day. 
And I was talking to my manager. She said, no, you're pastoring a church there too, aren't you? I said, yeah. She said, she said, how long have you been pastoring? I said, well, in 2001, it'll be 20 years. And I said, but before that, I pastored another 18 before that. And I said, you know, she said, how do you do that? I said, every Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> it's just every Sunday. And you know what? They come around right regular, don't they? They come around right regular. I recognize that Sunday's coming on Wednesday. <laughs> I'm going, it's almost over. It's another Sunday coming. <laughs> and she said, how do you do that? And I said, because I know it's what I'm supposed to do. But I said, I just don't want to be gone as many weeks during the year. But I said, I need to make this kind of money in order to, to just maintain myself. And I said, I want to work less but make more. And I said, I believe that God has given me a way where people are not going to be offended when I tell them they need to buy this and they'll buy it and then they'll walk out of the room. They're going to be happy. I'm going to be happy. The company's going to be happy and we'll all live happily ever after. You know what? And then, then sometimes it's, it's prejudiced. I think about how many times uh, I told my daughters when they were growing up, Never, ever let a man tell you you cannot do something just because you're a female. And that's when they stopped listening to me. So, <laughs> just saying. But it is true. It is true, and it's true because of who we are, because we're LGBT folks. People will tell you that you're not going to get any further because of who you are. That is a lie from the devil. We need to remind ourselves that we are part of an, an unlimited God. And not to allow anybody to tell us that there is a ceiling for us just because of who we are. That's a lie. That's a lie. You know, you can't go beyond this. This is your limit. I, I, I think about... Uh, I was talking to somebody the other day, and they've got a, a bachelor's, a master's, and they're working on their PhD. They're making an hourly wage because that's, because that's the only job they can get. They think that this new PhD is going to, I said a post hole digger degree, <laughs> PhD, you're going to be able to get a better job. I said, you were able to get a better job back here, but you chose not to. It was your choice. This is your choice. That was your choice here. That was your choice here. That was your choice here. What's going to happen? I said, now you're going to have all of these bills to pay for all these degrees. And what are you going to do? What are you going to do? I said, you need to start thinking differently. You need to start thinking that the God that we serve is an almighty God who's capable of providing an extravagant amount of money for his kids no matter who we are, no matter who we are. Since 1944, I don't know if you know this, but the U.S. has raised its debt ceiling 94 times since 1944, has raised the debt limit uh, 54 times by Republicans and 40 times by Democrats. They've done that so that they could let us know that there was a ceiling. We just didn't have, you know, <laughs> I think it's funny, just so we wouldn't have a, an unlimited amount. Well, what is an unlimited amount when each time you decide to raise the limit? And I'm telling you, you are not limited. You can change the limit of what you think God can do for you. You can change it. You can bust through that limit. You know, Robert used to fly a lot, and I thought about this too. You know, in aeronautics, there is a ceiling there too. There is a maximum height that a particular jet plane will function because of the altitude, the oxygen limit. And so what happens is, after that, the engine doesn't function. And if you're not careful, the plane will stall and crash because there is a natural ceiling limit there. There is one. But I got news for you. You know what? There's not one for us. But these four guys, these four guys must have had thoughts. This is absolutely crazy. This could be expensive. It's going to be a long, hard thing to drop through this ceiling, cut out all of this stuff, and drop this guy through the ceiling. This is simply not going to work. I'm going to tell you it will work. It 
it will work. I don't care who is working against us. I don't care how big the crowd is, how thick the floor is on that roof. And you got to remember, they slept outside on their roofs. So they were used to having lots of support through there, and they're cutting through this thing. I'm thinking, wow, that's going to be an expensive thing. But you know what? They didn't care. They didn't care because they thought it was the only way to get this guy fixed because there was nothing else they could do. They cared about him enough. Faith says to step out into the impossible. You know, I'll tell you something. When we start thinking that way, that sounds a little crazy. Sounds a little crazy. Yeah, sounds a little crazy like, you know what, stepping out of a perfectly good boat to walk on the water sounds a little crazy to me. Yeah. Sounds a little crazy that when they say, oh, that little boy with the five loaves and the two fishes, yeah, we're going to feed a multitude. That sounds a little crazy to me. But you know what? That's the kind of crazy that faith is. Paul said, I'll be a fool for Christ. He said, I will be considered, and the word foolish there is crazy, like the crazy guy that runs around the city. Everybody knows him. You know, we all know one of those crazy people. I had one in my office, his name was Jerry. You all have got one, his name may not be Jerry, but you've all got one, that crazy person that you know. Paul said that he'd be a fool for Christ. You know what? Sometimes we have to learn to be that. Why? Because it is just that kind of crazy that takes the roof off in the middle of a big crowded meeting and starts to hack away at the supports, hacking away, and all this debris is coming down and they're going like, what if this doesn't work? <laughs> we have really embarrassed ourselves and done all of this for really nothing. You know, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a thought. We face costly decisions. I'll tell you something. When you decide to do something, regardless of the consequences, there are things going on in the back of your head. Yeah. I can't even pay my electric bill, God, and he wants me to, he wants me to think about tithing. Yep. I, yeah. I, I give you an opportunity all the time. What's a tithe? Well, a tithe is 10% of everything that you get in goes to God. That's the first part of everything. You know what? I got paid yesterday, and the first thing that out of my bank account today is my tithe check. I know somebody else that got paid yesterday and gave before he even got to church. I know those kind of people. Why? Because they know if they don't, it won't work. See, in the natural, that is, I'm diminishing myself before I even pay my bills. I know that if I don't do that, I'll never be able to pay my bills. Because God somehow seems to make it go further, longer. I can't even provide for my family. I know some people that, that right now are in such dire straits because they stopped giving. I know it. They're embarrassed about it. But you know what, Pastor Kathy? The word is still the word, regardless of what happens. When all of that happens, that's the time to tear off the roof and say, you know what, I'm going to give anyway. I'm going to give anyway. Because if it's not going to last through the month, what difference does it make? Because I need to go ahead and give and show God to be who he is on my behalf. So, you know, when you start to think about tearing off the roof, these are things to think about. Just, it's not always about money. It's about being faithful. You know, coming to church is about being faithful. I know that people, man, they look for those summer months because vacations come. And I have no problem with people taking vacation. None whatsoever. I don't. I'd like to take one. Jeff and I are thinking about working on one right now. We've, Jeff's parents have asked us to go on uh, a couple of outings with them. And I want to go. I want to go. And I'm working at it desperately working at it, making it happen. So, you know, be faithful in your tithes and offerings. When you're faithful to God, only then can we expect God to do what he said he would do. Because he's expecting me to do that same thing. Faith says, I will see this through. I don't care. They're up there. They're chomping away at this thing. 
And they're saying, I don't know if it's going to work or not. Don't know. Don't know. Don't have any idea. But they went ahead and did it. In the spiritual sense, tearing the roof off of your faith takes time. I can promise you they didn't whack away at that very long until the roof came in. I'm sure that they continued to chunk, 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 chunk. I'm sure those people heard that thing going on. People are going to hear it when you make statements like, you know what, I'm believing God to take care of all of my financial needs. I'm believing God to make it happen where I can take a vacation. I'm believing God to pull in all the people that I need to make it work. I'm believing God that everyone is going to be maintaining their health so that nobody's out. I am believing God. When you start to sound like that, people start to listen. I'm sure those people heard those big chunks come in out of that roof. And then when they begin to see it happen, they begin to talk on the inside. And you know what? Somebody else was watching in there too. Somebody else was watching. But face, yes. Yes. She's not paying for that. Somebody else is paying for a trip to Rome. This week. Yeah, this week, this week, this week, give the Lord a hand clap. Because either it's going to work or it's not. Either it's going to work or it's not. Your mind is going to say, but what if it doesn't work for me? See, it's going to work for Pastor Kathy because I mean, she's dedicated her life to being in ministry and she's won so many contests in her past in our community because that's just who she is. That's just who she is. But what if it doesn't work for me? You see, the enemy will do all he can do to kind of worm his way in and tell you it will work for everybody else but you because of all of these things. You know what? All of those things are just one more person in the middle of that crowd. And you need to remember, you know what? I'm going over all those people. I don't care about all those people because I'm going to tear the roof literally right off. So look what happens when the roof does come off. This is what's amazing to me. You know, People say, well, there's a lot of time, there's a lot of effort, there's a lot of money, there's a lot of what if it doesn't work. You know what, I promise you that their hands hurt, I promise you that they got splinters, I'm sure that they got injured, some way minor scrapes tearing a roof off. I'm sure that they got hurt. I'm sure they did. There was a price to pay to do that. But the Bible says, when Jesus saw their faith, what they did was a manifestation of their faith. They took action on the only thing possible to get to what they wanted. They tore off the roof. That was the only thing they knew. All we got to do is got to get them to Jesus. Then Jesus is going to do the rest. But when Jesus saw their faith, miracles took place. Sins were forgiven. The place rejoiced because they saw the evidence of people's faith in action. They saw that. When you begin to say, you know what, I'm believing God for, I'm believing God for, you're chipping away at that roof because that faith is going to dig a hole and it's going to dig a hole and you're going to be able to get through to the other side. But the problem with it is, if you don't do anything, if there's no actions taken, then nothing's going to happen. So this week, I want you to think about yourself. But more importantly, is there somebody you know whose life needs a miracle? You need to let them know. You know what? I go to a church that believes in miracles. I know that there are people there that have financial miracles happen to them, to somebody that's on 
wealth, not welfare, but she's on the same thing as me. We're on Social Security, you know? Set standard of living. But God doesn't care about that set standard because he'll break a roof open in that. Take care of it, and you don't even have to pay tax on that money. That's even a better thing. So this week, I want you to think about what area of your life are you still frustrated with in your personal life or in the life of somebody else, a friend of yours, say, you know what, we just need to rip the roof right off and we need to believe God and you need to take action on that move. Join hands with somebody. Let's pray this morning. Father God, we thank you that today we have an opportunity to come before you and Father, we... We see miracles happen, and Father, we see and we rejoice because we know that if you did it for one, you can do it for someone else like us. And you can do it for me because I am no different than anyone else. And what you will do for them, you will do for me as well. So Heavenly Father, today we rejoice because we're going to rip roofs right off not only of our own lives, but in the lives of other people that we know. Father, we're going to speak good words into them so that they too can rejoice and have miracles in their life as well. So Heavenly Father, we give you all the praise and all the glory for today in Jesus' mighty name, in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen and amen and amen. God bless you.